This is On the Market, a Bigger Pockets podcast presented by Fundrise. What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to On the Market. Today, we have my friends Henry Washington, James Daynard, and Jamil Damji joining me for what is going to be a very fun episode. How are you all doing? Awesome. I'm doing great. So good. We're not doing as good as James because he's in like phenomenal temperatures and bragging about it. But oh. he looks so relaxed. He's like Kathy. Yeah, right. It's that it's, just... it's that California lifestyle. Just looking relaxed and healthy. Kathy is the most she's got the most peaceful vibe on her. <laughs> she's just she's just a roamer. Yes, that's a nice nice life. Nice temperatures, nice life. Southern California. Today, I know all three of you are excited to get into our due diligence section where we're going to be going into deals that you all are actually thinking about or doing right now, which will be super fun. But before we do that, we're going to go into between the headlines, talk about some of the latest news impacting the world of real estate investing. And today we are going to play a new game called Fortune Tellers, where you need to give me a 30 to 60 second reaction and prediction about what is going to happen given the information I give you. Everyone good? Let's do it. Yep. Yes, sir. All right. Sweet. So the first topic is about second home sales. I don't know if you have been following this over the last couple of years, but at a certain point, demand for second homes spiked to 90% of pre-pandemic levels, so nearly doubling over the last couple of years. And all those gains have pretty much been reversed. Redfin is now reporting that mortgage rate locks for second homes were up 9.1% from pre-pandemic levels. So that was 90%, now at 9.1%, basically back to where we were. Do you think this is going to impact the housing market? And do you think second home demand is ever going to spike like we just saw? Or was this a temporary blip? Jamel, what do you think? I think it was a temporary blip. You know, we all got trapped in our houses during the pandemic. And we had these dreams and these ideas that, oh, man, I want to live near James Daynard in in Southern California. And I I, I want that (laughs) other lifestyle. I want to have options, right? And I think the pandemic the pandemic gave us this idea that we all have options. And so, yes, there was a great demand, but you know, with that demand, we have all of these situations that we've created from there. And so I think that the spike in second home purchases was absolutely indicative of the time. And I think that it's, there's no chance of us getting back there again without another black swan event that pushes us there again, you know? And so personally, I think that's curbed. But I still believe that, you know, just the general housing market with respect to rates and pricing, I think that's also playing an effect. And so I I don't think we're going to see it come back the way that we we had it. Henry, what do you think? Man, I 100 percent agree. I mean, when you think about the pandemic changing everything, you're 100 percent right. You didn't you, you no longer had to you know, live where you worked. Right. And so people got these grand, they got bored. And then they started thinking of these grand ideas um, of where they could live because they didn't have to work there. And then also you think about, you've got um, people who now had to live and work in the same space with their family members. And I, even you saw a shift too in like, uh, you know, pre pandemic, it was all about open concept and then pandemic hits and people are like, well, you know, walls and separation aren't so bad. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so, it's and so, so people real. started looking for, for homes that fit their new lifestyle. Right. So the second home spike was huge because people were like, well, now I need a place that's got more space. Cause now I need a dedicated office space. Since so I have to be working, I need to be away from my family in a room somewhere, um, where I can get some peace and quiet or I can't get my job done. And, and the last thing that people wanted to do was lose their job in, in this, in those unfortunate, uh, you know, those uh, uncertain times. And so, yeah, that's, that spike second home. And, and, and you just got people that got bored, they got bored and they wanted to feel good, right? They were scared. And, you know, buying a new home kind of gave people that temporary, hey, this is exciting. I can be excited about something again. Um, And I I think you saw a spike. But this is what people like everybody's been saying, when are we going to return to normal? When are we going to get back to normal? Well, this is part of getting back to normal. We got to we're going to get back to 
the financial normal that was before, right? So we've got, we'll get back to second home price uh, sales being down. We'll get back to interest rates being where they were before that, right? All these things that people weren't thinking about when they meant get back to normal is part of that too. Yeah, that's a great point. James, I'm curious what you think in a broader sense, but also if you believe that this will impact pricing and for short-term rentals, because a lot of second homes are in the same markets where people are targeting for short-term rentals. Curious what you think will happen there. You know, I I do think that that asset class is going to be the one that deflates the most or one of the most over the next six to 12 months. Uh, It it reminded me, and I was talking to somebody like six months ago about this, because these secondary home prices went through the roof, like at, at in areas that do not typically appreciate that quick. Um, and they were appreciating probably 10 times as, as fast as they're typically done. And, and it reminded me of 2007, because I'll say it was the same type of concept. Like in Washington, we have this place called Suncadia. It's a nice golf course community. People live there. They rent it out. It's amazing. I had a, I had a VRBO there myself. But I remember it inflated at almost the same rate as what it was doing right now. And those secondary markets are the ones that pop the worst too. And so that as the demand goes down, I do think that there's going to be a good 10 to 15% deflation in that market. In 2008, we saw a 40% drop in those asset classes. And that was a different thing. It was a totally different type of you know, banking crisis. But as we see things come down, yes, people's novelty of them do wear off. They're going to start selling them. And then as people start to get a little worried about inflation, the secondary market, I do think that the VRBO market could slow down as well. Um, you know, as liquidity dries up and an inflation starts really eroding people's access to capital, the first thing that goes is vacations, going places and traveling. And so I do think that the secondary home market, the Airbnb investor market, that, that is going to have a little bit of trouble over the next four to six months. Um, as it kind of normalizes out, but it's what comes up must come down in the ones that hockey stick the most. Those are the ones that are going to probably come down the quickest. And if you really look at the secondary home market right now, as inflation's eating up people's expenses, you don't want to go buy another house to service if you're not going to rent it out. And in addition to when you factor in the new rates that are 30% higher than they were four or five, four months ago, it really affects your monthly payment to where it just doesn't become worth it. And if it's not worth it, things don't trade. And so that's where I think things are going to really settle down and come backwards. And, and, you know, and if you are looking for a secondary home, you're probably going to be able to get one in the near future. That's a great point, James. And one thing I've been reading about that I think is really interesting in this Redfin article is the authors were speculating that a big reason this is dropping off as well is due to the stock market just tanking. Mm -hmm. There's just so many people who had a lot of cash and just a lot of excess money to spend on a second home because of the stock market. Now that it's down 20% of the year or whatever it is at the time of this recording, um, that until the stock market goes back up again, which could be a while, probably not going to see that demand go up. All right, for our second headline today, we're only going to do two today. I want to talk about the lock-in effect, which, if you haven't heard already, is this idea that because interest rates were so low for so long, that so many home buyers and homeowners have locked in rates that are ultra low, and we may not see again for a while. We might not ever see again in our entire lives. Just to bring some context to this, For years, we were seeing mortgage interest rates at 3%. At some point in in January of 2021, it actually went as low as 2.7% for a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. Now it's at about 5.3% at the time of this recording. And the idea here is that why would you sell? Like if you were a homeowner right now, why would you sell your house so that you can enter an ultra-competitive market with high prices only to pay more interest on your loan? And That makes sense to me, but the implication here is that inventory could remain down and that could help continue to provide upward pressure on housing prices over the next few years. So Henry, let's start with you. Get your crystal ball out. What do you think is going to happen? Are people going to stop selling in in large numbers and is the lock-in effect going to be a real phenomenon over the next few years oh man of course you made me go first so i can sound like the jerk face uh here's 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 my general thoughts right like yes uh people are going to be comfortable with those lower interest rates especially right now they're thinking you know i don't know how high these interest rates are going to go i'm going to stay put where i'm at 
And uh, all that sounds good now because they just locked in their new interest rate, you know, six months ago, a year ago, a year and a half ago, right? Um, But people don't typically sell homes as a financial decision. It's more of an emotional decision, right? They are selling for a particular reason. Maybe their family's expanded. Maybe they've got a new job and they're making more money. Maybe they... um, uh, are downsizing and want a smaller home, right? Maybe they need to move closer to family. Like there's people sell their primary residences for more situational or emotional reasons. And does that mean interest rates or what it's going to cost you doesn't play? Of course it plays into it. Um, but it's not the only factor that they're considering. And a lot of the times we know people see motions overrule the, the best financial decision, the, you know, decision point most of the time. And so, uh, will, the lock-in effect slow down inventory? Yeah, I think so. I think there are some savvy homeowners out there who are who are just going to say, hey, it's better for me to stay put because their lifestyle or their family situation will allow them to continue to stay where they are. And I think the ones that whose lifestyle or uh, family situation changes, they're still going to look to buy. I mean, as long as interest rates aren't at like, you know, 15% or something like that, you, you know, where, where it, just, <laughs> it's, it just doesn't, you literally can't do it. But I think if people have the financial ability to do it. Their situations are probably going to dictate that they do it and they pro- and they want to. It feels good to buy a new home. It feels good to to upgrade your lifestyle and most people um are there's tons of people who just aren't thinking financially for this decision. It's just not that important to them if they can afford it. All right, James, what do you think? Do you think this is going to have an impact on prices in the housing market or is this just going to impact, you know, a small number of people? I think uh, there's always going to be a section of the population that's going to, it's going to really impact or to where they're, they're going to be fixated on the rate cost. I mean, I I talk to investors all the time. They're like, they're always pricing the rate because they're going after rate first. Like how do we get the cheapest rate? How do we get the cheapest rate? And so there is that mindset where I think people are going to lock in. They can't see past anything else, but their rate and their uncomfortable payment and they're, they're not going to be selling. But I do think that you know, investors and people and just the, or especially Americans, they live in the now. And so it's always right now, it seems expensive on the money, but it's going to get normalized in the next six to 12 months. And the more normal it is, people are just going to say, well, I'm going to go do those things now. Like I'm going to have to refi, even though my rate's going up <clears throat> for the six next six to 12 months, I think people are going to not be wanting to move around. But as it gets more normal, as rates seem like they're, they stay where they should be, that people are just going to go for it or, or, or just going to get used to it. One thing I do think is that a lot of people locked in low rates. They have a lot of equity position. And if we move into some sort of recession, which it looks like we might be doing, and then with the inflation factor eating up people's extra income, I do think there's going to be a boom of cash out refis to where people all of a sudden, it, that's going to become the norm. Because they need it, because they need the cash rather than because the rate is attractive. Yeah, I do think that the the general public has gotten used to spending money the last 24 months, or at least a, a portion of it. Not everybody, but uh, you know, people that are buying homes and, and they've had access to money, they've seen their equity positions explode over the last 12 to 24 months. At some point, though, as inflation is getting to 10 percent in the market, things are getting more expensive. We got these Ukraine, th- you know, we got these conflicts overseas, and, and, and we're going to be going into, you know, as a recession rolls in, that could be less paying jobs. There's other things that are going to eat up people's disposable income, and I do think because people do live in the now, they want to keep going with that disposable income, and they're going to be fixed it on that rate until they're not, and they're just going to say, "Hey, look, now I'm going to go tap into my good purchase." And, and, and do refi it out. In addition to people also bought homes and they went to go build them out and, you know, design them themselves. They traded a house that they lived in for a long time. They got into a new property. They got a bigger one and their bids are coming back at record high numbers. And they thought they were making the right trade, but now they don't have the liquidity to finish the rehab. And so I think there is going to be a little bit of a reset, you know, where, where people are going to have to pull out cash out. And, and so I do think, People are going to do what they have to do. If they can keep their low rate, they will. And if then they can't, then they're, they're, people get used to uh, you know paying a higher rate. That's a really good point. Living in the now is a very good way to describe how people 
<laughs> spend the, spend their money. Mm-hmm. All right, Jamil, before we move on to our deal analysis part of the show, what is the last word on the lock-in effect? I 100% agree with a, a blend of both of what, of what these guys are saying. I think what James really nailed there was just how short-term our memory can get with respect to you know what's happening in life. Because look, everybody is talking about, oh my God, these rates are so high, these rates are so high. It's because we've all forgotten We've all forgotten that 5% mortgage rates or 6% was normal. And then we got used to this 2 3% for a little while. And we're like, oh my God, that's where it needs to be. But our brains will reset. <laughs> our brains will reset. And just like James said, we'll be in the now and we'll say, yeah, five is, five is normal. 6% is normal. This is, this is totally okay. We'll forget about the 2 and 3% mortgages. We're going to forget about that. It's just going to take a little bit of time and then people are going to move along in a life. And like Henry was talking about, situations are going to continue to persist. Life will happen. And no matter how much we want to pretend that we all love to make these really smart and strong financial decisions for ourselves and our families, when it's time to buy some jet skis, we get jet skis. (laughs) That's what's up, you know? And so... I think I, <laughs> sounds I think like it sounds like you're speaking from experience here, Jamel. <laughs> I don't jet ski, but I'm, you ever seen a sad guy on a jet ski? <laughs> <laughs> it's not possible. It's a smile factor. Right? Yeah. You can't be sad on a jet ski. <laughs> well, I, all right. So all three of you are selling the idea of the lock-in effect. I actually think it is going to play a, a role until the market gets less competitive. Because why would you enter this market? Like, why would you sell only to face more bids? But we're already seeing the market get less competitive. So I think it will sort of be this trade-off. As the market gets less competitive, people will be more willing to sell and get back into it. With that, we are going to move on to our next section, uh, where Jamil, James, and Henry are all going to share a deal. I know that they're all chomping at the bit to talk about deals and actually get into the numbers. This is going to be a lot of fun. But first, we'll take a quick break. We'll be right back after this. All right, we are back to this episode of On the Market, and we are going to do, I think this is the first time maybe in Bigger Pockets podcast history, we are going to like break down some actual deals in real time. And we were all chatting before this, and I know there's some contentious, contentious uh, undertones behind some of these deals. So I just want to get started with, get started with Jamil first, because he's got a deal. He's got a deal, and I think, I think Henry's going to rip him apart. So yes, let's just... Start with this deal. Jamil, tell us what you got. So to give everybody a little bit of backstory on me, if you don't know, I'm a wholesaler and it's in my DNA. And so I haven't held a lot of property. I'm, I, I'm constantly trading. I'm trading, 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 trading. Look at Henry's already disappointed in me. Uh, I haven't held, I haven't really held anything. I hold, I hold a, a beach house in California and my own personal home. And other than that, I trade everything. That's just what I do. And it became really clear to me how much of a mistake that was when just for my, my last tax bill <laughs> was just over $800,000, okay? And so my lifestyle has absolutely changed over the last few years. There's, you know, success has, has come our way and I'm super grateful for it. And I'm looking at my, my you know, best friend and, and co-star on our TV show who is doing a tremendous amount of business as well. And he got a refund you get a thirty two hundred dollar <laughs> refund and i'm i'm meanwhile i'm paying eight hundred thousand dollars plus in taxes and it's it's sad right it's sad to me that that's the the differences in our lives because i've been so inefficient with respect to how i'm i'm approaching life so <laughs> what i've done is i i decided I, I came across this deal and i don't know if we can pull it up on the screen if not i'll just kind of give us the deal points this is a multifamily acquisition in the Arcadia neighborhood of Arizona. That's 85018. Is that near Phoenix? In Phoenix, correct. Okay. That's where everyone wants to live right now, right? Correct. Correct. So this is the neighborhood that I live in. In fact, this building is around the corner from my house. I can walk there in 30 seconds. It's a, a 53-unit multifamily, all one bed, one bath. To give you an idea of the, uh, the neighborhood, the annual household income, the average annual household income for this Arcadia area is $122,000. Whereas in Phoenix, the average is about $72,000. So you can 
gives you an idea of the demographic that lives in the neighborhood. The median home sales price as of April was $1.7 million. And in comparison to Phoenix, the median house, the, the median sales price is $515,000. So this neighborhood is, is incredible. Now, let me tell you about the deal. So the acquisition cost of the deal is $12.5 million. That's $235,000 a door. Looking at the comparables of what is traded in, in the neighborhood with the same sweet mix, with the same sort of parameters, we have an as is value of around 280 a door without any repositioning. This is a group, the group that owns it right now, they, they're out of Canada, and for whatever reasons, they are deciding to liquidate. They had started a renovation. They actually renovated 46 of the 53 units, and they renovated them to incredible standards. Beautiful, beautifully modern. Uh, it's, it's, they're incredible. Seven of the units are left to remodel. Currently, the gross monthly rent is around $63,600. And the units are renting at about $1,200 a month. Rents can increase to $1,700 a month, and that's conservatively based on the style, the neighborhood, and the type of unit that we've got. So there's a, a, a large gap in a reposition there. Now, here's where my problems run. We can take this building down. It's going to require us to come out of pocket around $2.5 million for the down payment. And we're looking at a debt service of around $60,000 a month. So cash flow as it sits right now is negative or flat. There's, there's really, you know, there's, there's not a lot of income to be made right now without a reposition. But if we renovate the last seven units and we reposition the, the, the building, increase the rents to $1,700, we're looking at roughly $18,000 a month in net income after you adjust for expenses and vacancy. So we're looking at a, total value once we reposition the building of around $17.5 million. So there's a gain of around $5 million to be made. On top of that, if I look at and do a cost segregation study on the building, I can save roughly $2 million in taxes. So when I look at this, I can put $2.5 million down to acquire the building. That's going to save me $2 million in tax liability. Or I can take the exit strategy that I'm good at and know, and I actually have a contract right now. I have a buyer for the building right now at $15 million. <laughs> so I can make a $2.5 million assignment fee, would be the biggest assignment fee I've ever made, add to my tax liability, <laughs> or I can take the building down and do the, the right thing, which is I know what Henry wants me to do, take the building down, depreciate, save, save money on taxes, and create cash flow. So this is my, this is the, the deal. The risks that I see, the current rental market could turn. We might, you know, see some, our projections could be off with respect to how much rents escalated. I don't think so, but it, it, it's possible. We could run into some issues with, with project management because this would be uh, a, a, a deal that I really don't have a lot of experience in doing. And so we could mismanage it and we could totally fumble the ball and, 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 and ruin that. Uh, just because of our lives and how busy we are. Uh, and so that's kind of what I'm playing with. Do I take the $2.5 million right now, add to my tax liability and do what I do as a wholesaler? Or do I take the building down, save money in taxes and create cash flow? Well, my first question is, do you have the 2.5 to buy? Yes. Or do you have to raise money and, and give out the equity on the deal? So it's 100% owned by you. I, so I, I will... I will bring in Pace Morby as my business partner on, on the deal. He'll, he'll acquire it with me. So each of us would be coming in with 1.25. 1.25, and then it's a 50-50 split on that deal. Correct. I will give you $1,000 for 1% of the deal. <laughs> <laughs> so so on this deal, so, you, so you're looking at a tax savings of a million in, uh, each. off the cost sec. Yeah, a million Correct. each on that deal. Yeah. So, so basically, you're coming up with 1.25, and you get a million dollar tax savings, which is or off the top, which is going to save you for what in your bracket, if you're hitting 800 grand, it's going to save you 400 grand right away on your, on year one, uh, or not year one, but it's, it's going to pop back. Um, what, 
one of my biggest questions would be if these things are all renovated, why is the performance 25% higher than where, where it's at right now? If they're an investment company that stabilized it, they renovated it to the highest and best used, why, why they're so far below market? And do you think that has anything to do with Arcadia being a family neighborhood and one bed, one bath won't trade well in that, that kind of climate? Well, they're, they're 100% occupied. And, you know, I'm, again, looking at the just the, the rent comparable, 1700 is actually pretty conservative for a one bed, one bath in the neighborhood. You're absolutely right. It is a family neighborhood. And so there's, there are fewer, there's less demand for that type of unit. That's the, the hands down tr a real thing, but the schools are better here. There's a, still a lot of uh, the population here that's servicing the people that live in the neighborhood that, you know, the, 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 the householders here. And so I think that just having access to that type of product is, is, isn't needed for the neighborhood because you can just check, see by the vacancies, there, there's a demand for it. Now, why are they so underperforming? Uh, that's a great question. And I think a lot of the rent escalation that's happened over the last, you know, 12 months is, is, is a reason for it. I think at the time when they had, re when they had increased to $1,200 a month, that that was a, a deal at the time. But I think that they thought that that was the highest that they were at. And now with where rents have gone, and again, we're banking on rent staying where they've spiked to, right? And so that's, I think that's the juggling act that we're in right now, because if for whatever reason, rents go down, we're in, we're, we're in trouble. But how much trouble? Like if, if rents went down 10%, how long would it take for that 10% decline in cash flow to eat away at the million dollars in tax savings? Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I, I agree. And that's, that's, that was my exact thought. Like you think about what you're getting in savings from taxes versus what you're having to put down versus the cash flow you're going to create by finishing the renovation and, 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 and putting all the, all the units at, at market rents. All that's great. Um, rents typically don't go down. Jamil, I mean, does it mean they can't? No, absolutely not. Uh, sure, sure, something could happen when they do. But the benefits of this property for you are on the tax side more so than they are on the cash flow side. And you're going to get the appreciation from this property as you continue to hold it. And the thing that I think is great, so I love one bed, one bed, one bath units. I love one bed, one bath units in neighborhoods that are super desirable and family neighborhoods because it gives a subset of people who want to live in that super cool part of town who can't afford a house a way in a way to say this is where i live i live in this neighborhood um and so i think you just tweak a little bit of your marketing and you'll have more people wanting to live there than you know what to do with um Right. Because being able to get a one bed, one bath in a neighborhood where it costs 1.5 to buy a house on the average is, you know, is, is, is impossible to find. Right. And so I think you're right. always going to have demand because even if rents go down, it sounds like in this area, your rents aren't going to decline as much as maybe like Phoenix Metro might decline. Right. Or, uh, correct. Correct. And so, you know, this is, you're, I mean, I'm a buy and hold guy, so for me, this is a no brainer, right? You buy that. So you'd hold this all day, and you would you would forego the two point five million dollar quick assignment fee that, as a wholesaler, I want to take. Yep, I want both. You get a hundred. So do you get a hundred percent of the two five, or you are you fifty fifty on that too? It would be fifty fifty because I brought Pace into the deal. Yeah. I, I needed his money before I even. Yep. I'm two hundred and fifty thousand dollars non refundable on my on my EMD. Yeah, so like on that that scenario, so that's one point two five. So you're you're walking with six hundred fifty grand after taxes, right? And so it, it's really you know if you're picking up five million dollars in equity, if your numbers are right and you're picking up that upside right there day one on the the buying margin, and then you get up there, you're picking up three to four million in wealth plus picking up a a million two in tax savings. All for six hundred grand. Yeah, that's that's. And so do the math on that. That's yes. you, you're you're. 3x in your money at that point but right. you have to wait and so right. uh and you can you, you know. can always exit jamil somebody will always buy this deal because of the desirability um of the neighborhood and f f frankly the de desirability of the units my one bed one bass are my best performing units i can't i can't rent them fast enough when they're vacant and people stay forever mm -hmm. i love them there's also a play where we take a portion of the building and we turn them into short-term rentals, you know, because it is a resort style building. We got a beautiful pool. There's a fitness center. I mean, 
It's an incredible property. It's an incredible property. Do it. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. All right. Is everyone voting? Hold. I don't know. If, I, I guess we're turning this into a voting show, but I say hold it. Henry's obviously hold it. James? I, I think, honestly, it's a no-brainer to hold it. You're, you're 3Xing by keeping it right away. It just keep it. Keep it. Okay. Thank you, guys. Every, every bit of me is like, you're so dumb, Jamil. There's $2.5 million, $1.125 million, but you're going to have to pay taxes on it. But it's still like, come on. <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, that is, it's very tempting, but it's so tempting. We're, we're here for you, Jamil. This yeah. is the I'll be your, I'll be your su- support group. I'll be your support group. Support sure. group for you. I'll be your accountability <laughs> now, partner. James, should I go raise the, my portion of cash that I require to get into this deal, bring in an equity partner, not be into it for cash at all, and just have this as a depreciation play? I mean, that's what some people do. You can get the, you can get the best of both worlds. You could pack package that deal up, charge an assignment fee to the deal like most syndicators do. So you can still get your, your wholesale fee, give out, you know, a portion of the equity. Typically it's going to be, you're giving out 70% of the ownership of that building, keep the 30. So you can get the best of both worlds, get your assignment fee, uh, keep 30% ownership. You can continue to get fees by managing that project with pace. And then all of a sudden you're still making your income and getting the ownership. Plus you'll get 30% of the, the cost seg depreciation over the tax return. So there is a, the middle answer of do both. Mm. Yeah. I, I, all right. I think that's, I think that's awesome for someone not in your financial position. I think you can afford to do this on your own and you yeah. need to do it based on what you just told us. You pay in taxes. Might want to keep this one for yourself. Thank you guys. I appreciate the advice. All right. We're going to, we're going to have to come back to this and, and see how you're doing. Yeah. Make sure you're not just like going to sell it randomly one day. July 11th is my close date. So, you know, All right, uh, we'll the check audience that. hold me, hold me accountable. Ask me the questions, Henry, James, Dave, ask me the questions. July 11th is the day I'm either going to be walking away with my assignment fee or I'm going to be walking away with a building. We'll see what happens. All right. Or maybe both. Okay. With that, let's move on to uh, Henry's deal. Henry. I'm sure it's going to be a buy and hold after this conversation, <laughs> right, I can't, but I can't, tell us what you got. It's a similar situation, too. So, yeah, let's talk about it. It's not, The numbers aren't as amazing as Jamil's, but this is just one unit. So I've got a deal. It's a three-bed, one-bath, single-family home um, in Bentonville, Arkansas, in a very desirable neighborhood of Benton, Bentonville, Arkansas, right? And so it is um, – purchase price is 225000 Now – this area of town is a really, really highly desirable area because of a couple of things. It's near downtown Bentonville, which is like where people want to live in the Bentonville area. It is, there's so much money been poured into there. There's museums that have gone up, walking trails. Like it is where people in Bentonville want to live, hang out, party, socialize, shop. And then it's, um, maybe a two to three minute walk away from where Walmart is building their brand new state of the art home office uh, uh, complex. And so they are building this complex to compete with the Amazons and the apples for the talent that they need to hire to keep Walmart relevant. And so it's, it's supposed to be this phenomenal state of the art um, and they've already started construction. And so, the purchase price like is inflated because of the neighborhood. Uh, Typically, if I were going to buy a three bed, one bath, 1100 square foot home that was built, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the sixties in any other part of Northwest Arkansas, I would probably pay no more than a hundred grand, right? Maybe 120 grand, but we're paying 225 for this one because the ARV on the property, because of where it is, they just built a brand new private school. They call it the Thaden School. It's you can throw a rock and hit it from the front yard of this place. And so, because people are going to want wealthy people are going to want their kids to go to this school, right? They're going to be looking for properties that are closer to these areas. Um, and it's a great that makes it a great Airbnb location too. But so. The ARV on this property is five hundred and fifty thousand, mm. right? And so we're bu- Ooh, we're buying it to twenty five, and to renovate it to the nines, which is what we would need to do um, to get that five fifty. We're gonna have to put seventy to eighty into it, um, and then we can exit that thing for five fifty, which puts my potential profits after commissions and fees uh, above two hundred thousand, which is. 
phenomenal for a single family flip. Uh, Two twenty five in uh, in Arkansas, right? Like so you're almost doubling your money. yeah, absolutely. So phenomenal flip, right? But I love the location, right? And so uh, there's a and I have more than one exit, right? And so I can look at, hey, do I wholesale this thing, which is just sell it in the current condition that it's in. And the market says I can probably get around 310 uh, for that. And I could probably stick that thing on the market and have that money in my pocket in you know, 30 to 45 days. And that's about a 60 grand profit to do almost nothing. Clean it up, make some minor repairs, make sure that it'll pass a, you know, an FHA or a conventional loan inspection. Right. And that's about a 60K profit. So I can get 60K quick or I can make sub to or above 200 in, you know, four to five months would be would be what I would think it would take uh, me to get this done or we can rent it right which is which is uh, what I would normally do but when you look at rents right now I think I could only get about two grand a month for this thing right and so when you're mm. buying at 225 and then you're putting and now if I rent it out I wouldn't have to put as much into it but I'd still have to put 30 to 40 into it right and so I'd be you know sub 250 260 270 and renting it for 2000 you know that's negative cash flow but i would get all what about short term what would you get on the short term rental short term rental i'd have to put more into it 70k probably but i could get four to five grand a month before we get into this can i just ask you henry how do you find this deal that's a phenomenal question so i found this deal through direct mail so this was a direct mail marketing driving for dollars so i have people i've got about two people who consistently drive for me so they go out and they identify uh distressed properties and then i send those people direct mail and then i also cold call i have a cold caller that cold calls this list so this is one i've been sending mail to for a while and didn't get much of a response had a nice. had a cold caller call them and then boom got them on the phone and it was just timing they were just ready to sell it's funny i went to go look at the house so they called me and they were like hey we want to get out of this thing we've had a tenant in there she's not paying rent and uh uh we just want to sell it with with them in there and, and be done with it and i went to go look at it and it was the first time they had been in the house in over a year and so i'm walking the house kind of with them and they're seeing the same things i'm seeing they hadn't seen it in over a year i literally walk in the bathroom and uh the floor is having so much water issues that i they had covered up with rugs that i literally wo- fell right through the, f- the floor <laughs> oh, my God. oh my just God. step through yeah, the floor. stepped right through the floor oh that's ridiculous that's i have also f- fallen through the floor <laughs> it's a sign of a good deal if you fall through the floor it's a Buy it now. I was like, good timing, because they're like, <laughs> my my price just went down when, <laughs> when I went through the floor, and they and they had no idea there was a problem there. <laughs> You're like, I might need to get an engineer out here, right? <laughs> right, <boy."> uh, absolutely. <laughs> so you found it driving for dollars, which is great for anyone listening to this. Obviously, that works. Um, so I know a lot of people who say they can't get deals. This is obviously a good example. How would you finance the two twenty five? Yeah, so we're going to use a small local bank to finance the deal, and um, they are going to finance it at um, so at seventy percent of the appraised value. And so, as long as it appraise whatever it appraises for, they'll loan me up to seventy percent. So, as long as what I need to purchase and renovate that property, so the two twenty five plus the eighty, if that is under 70% of that appraised value, then I won't have to bring anything to the table. If it is the, the uh, lower that appraisal comes back, the more money I'll have to put in. But, uh, and so Henry, what, what is your plan with this property? Is it, I mean, it, like, cause I, and the math hits on a lot of different ways. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it, it obviously cash flows well on the short term, but not so well on the, 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 the long term. Unfortunately, about 90 days ago, it actually probably would have broke even, right, 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 you know, with right, the race. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I was playing with all the race yesterday and I was like, man, this is brutal. So now you're at a point where you're not. So are you, are you, are you planning on keeping this or, I mean, I know what I would do with it, but, um, yeah, I love the location. And just like I said to Jamil, like I can always sell this because this new home office complex at Walmart's building is coming and there's a higher chance that that increases values than it does decrease the values. Um, 
this is, I don't think this is an area that becomes any less desirable anytime soon. So I'm willing to bank on the fact that it's going to go up. And, uh, and so my, my, my initial reaction is I'm going to keep it as a short term rental. And if I make cash flow every month, that's awesome. And if I don't and I break even, I'm OK with that, too, um, for now, because once they finish building what they're building um, and as that area continues to appreciate, um, it'll be a, a cash flow monster on the Airbnb side. And if it decides it's not, then I can sell it at a different point and still make a phenomenal profit. I'm entering it pretty well for the for what the ARV is. Can I ask Henry like it, do you have enough deal flow that if you flipped it you would be able to reallocate that money into a good cash other cash flowing assets that have a better cash on cash return than this one? Yeah, um yeah, I do. I I I I've got other deals that I could that I could flip it into. Um it, but I, you know, honestly, I, if I, if I sold this, it'd be one, I'd want a 1031 into something. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I like the idea of 1031s. Um, but I think if you don't have something lined up, that's a good deal to 1031 into a lot of people sometimes end up buying an okay or not so great deal just because they have to 1031. And then, you know, was it really that much better than paying the taxes? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. And, and so if I had something lined up perfectly, that was going to be, um, you know, a better cash flowing machine, um, then I might consider doing that. I don't have anything in the pipeline for that right now. I could probably go get something. What would you do, James? Uh, wait, wait, so my vote, I mean, Honestly, I'm a guy that sells that deal. Uh, I, I, I like I like the air like path of progress is a great thing. You know what's coming in there. But if I'm losing six to seven grand a month on that property and negative cash flow, I'm gonna I'm gonna claim the equity and reposition that profit into some other deal or like what you said, keep it as a I, I call those equity earner properties where or equity in my portfolio growers where I keep that deal for one year. I take the short term pain. I, I limp along on that property for a 12 month period. And then I 1031 it into something else. Um, because then you can take that huge equity spread, defer the taxes and pick up some major cash flow, or trade into that same exact neighborhood with your equity position and have and actually get it to be cash flowing. So you're kind of moving things around. But it, it, right now with things the way they're going, I, I just don't buy appreciation. And, and so it's I, for me, if I'm losing money on this deal, which you're probably negative, what, five, 600 bucks a month on that at two grand a month on the rental, it, it you know, that's just it. I don't like the liability. I absolutely would not long term rent it. I would short term rent it. And that's and that's assuming that short term rentals stay as robust as they are. I mean, you know, James had a great point at the beginning of the episode that we may see some pain in the short term rental market, you know, in the, in the coming while. And so uh, there that could be something that could become a factor for you, Henry. For me, uh, you know, my vote on this would be uh, the same as James. In fact, I, I wouldn't even I wouldn't even do the renovation on this thing. I would take your first approach. I'd wholetail that thing. I'd make the sixty grand, and I'd move into the next deal. I knew both of you would say those things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm tempted because I also am primarily a buy and hold investor, but. I agree that I, I'm worried about the short term rental market. My my, I only have one, but I'm seeing bookings seriously down from last year. And I know several other short term rental investors who are experiencing the same thing. These are a class properties in good neighborhoods who, that are seeing declines in bookings. And I think we haven't even hit a recession. So I, I'm personally a little concerned about that. I've never flipped a house in my life, so I, I don't. I'm being a total hypocrite here, but I would say flip it. Uh, one thing I will say is hotels just skyrocketed the last sixty days. Like I went to book for work out, and they're two and a half times what they were for the last twelve months. So I mean that that could protect the VRB, or the Airbnb a little bit, but. Yeah, they, they, they stepped on their pricing for sure. And these are not areas that I'm going to that people want to travel to. It's just, it's a work destination, uh, but they're they're expensive. What I didn't get into with this market um, uh, that's that's um, kind of aiding my decision is that um, Bentonville is a phenomenal Airbnb market because this is such a tourist destination um, for outdoor sports. It's the mountain biking capital of the world. It's got the Walmarts, the JB hunts, the Tyson foods all headquartered here, bringing people to, to, to come here to work and stay short term. Um, and so you have a lot of people coming here to visit 
and you don't have nice hotels here. There's maybe two to three really nice mm-hmm. hotels in the area. And then everything else is like extended stays and La Quinta's and like people don't, people don't want those when there's nice Airbnbs. And so, um, and still there's not a ton of Airbnbs and they go quick. And so it's a really unique market for short term rentals. Um, and so, yeah, ex- absolutely. I, I know I am picking the riskier strategy. Um, and I don't want to like, uh, I don't want to encourage everyone to take the riskiest strategy when you're doing something like this. I have a portfolio that will that will help me stay insulated if things turn. And so I can choose to be a little riskier when the location, location, location factor is good. And so don't take me making this decision, you know, new people as you taking the riskiest option or the riskiest exit strategy on a deal. I have the benefit of being able to do that because I have a portfolio that will hold me up if something goes awry. But I'm also willing to bank on a the location and b what's coming um, so that I can continue to cash flow this thing big time in the long term. And at the end of the day, if in 12 months, 24 months, I look at this thing and I want out, I know I can get out of it pretty well. All right, you convinced me, Henry. I'm on team short-term rental now. (laughs) It's just my instinct. I mean, there's just only so many opportunities to be close to a slam dunk economic engine, right? Absolutely. If you could pick, you know, being in Silicon Valley or, you know, any of these giant things back in the day. That's what I've been telling you. And like Walmart is not going anywhere and Walmart in a recession is going to do better I want to do better. Hotel, hotel this to me, Henry. I, I That's what I tell. Go today, <laughs> uh, James, Jamil, anybody listening, go today and look at home prices in and around Microsoft's home office. Go look at home prices in and around Amazon's home office. Go look at home, like right around, like literally less than a mile away from it. Go look at what they're selling for compared to anything else in that area. But how much? How much is the five fifty ARV? How much is that up from eighteen months ago? Not a ton. Not a ton. That's a phenomenal oh, question. Yeah, well, not a ton. There we go. Well, then the upside could be, then Henry, I'm not, I'm not totally yeah. against your idea. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a short term rental yeah. guy, man. That thing is painful for me. Yeah. I don't, I don't I know. I just give it to somebody else. Have a certain thickness yeah. of skin. Yeah. yeah exactly. I don't manage it. Absolutely not. All right. Well, speaking of Microsoft's headquarters, let's move to uh, Pacific Northwest over here with James. Tell us about your deal. Yeah, Henry got me with the Microsoft. Uh, <laughs> all of a sudden, I started thinking about it. Um, hey, so we found a deal. We have deals in all different types of price ranges up in the Pacific Northwest. Sometimes we're spending $2 million to buy it. Sometimes it's it's much cheaper, depending on what you're looking to get. Uh, so this is a deal that we sourced off market. We actually hired a call room called uh, it's Call Magic, and, and so we pound the phones on landlords that maybe want to trade out. Like so, this guy had had owned the property for a long time, and and it was a good time for him to sell it. Um, what it is, is a three bed, one bath, 1250 square foot house in Tacoma, Washington, which is about 35 minutes out of Seattle, 40 minutes out sub market. That's been appreciating a pretty high rate. Um, and in addition to, it's got a 450 square foot unfinished basement on the house. So right around, it's going to be roughly around 18, 1900 square foot fully finished. Um, the reason I like this deal all the way around is because the purchase price is actually, it's $285,000. The reason I like that is this is a re- this is going to be a recession proof deal. So we there's a, a multiple exit strategies on this, and so as we're looking at this, we can look at three different options. The first option is we just renovate the upstairs, twelve hundred square feet. We put seventy thousand in, and we sell it for sure at four sixty nine. We have comparables that are actually at four seventy five to four eighty five, but because of what we're going into with the rates adjusting up, we actually kind of tick that back down five percent. So that at the four sixty nine, we already baked in. The cushion on the on the resale, or we can put in ninety to a hundred thousand into the renovation, finish the basement, add another bathroom, and then the value is going to be at four ninety nine to five thirty five. We have three comps at five thirty five, but again, we kind of back down our comp to four ninety nine to adjust for the interest rate hikes because all those comps were from March, uh, you know, February, March, and April, which the market was a little bit hotter then. So what we're looking at on the two flips is we're looking at we can make about. 50,000 on the first way, the cosmetic, which we can probably get in and out in four to five months, which is going to be about a 50% cash on cash return. 
Or we can do the larger renovation, which is going to take about seven months, is it, it, we're going to profit out about 60000 with a little bit of upside to where we're going to get about a 55 to 60% cash on cash return in the next six months. Or the, the third option is we can do a burr on this one. And the reason it's going to work as a burr is it's hitting all the different metrics. We, we get, we're getting that equity position. We're buying it cheap enough to where we're at 285 to max out the rents on this, we're not gonna have to finish out the whole basement as well. So we can do a quick renovation, put a renter in there. It will rent for $2,500 a month. We have four different rental comps. One's at 2,800, so there's a little bit of upside still left in the deal as well. Um, and then uh, we're gonna be able to cash flow that deal about 150 bucks a month after we renovate it. We purchase it with hard money, refi it, refi it into a new conforming loan. We're gonna leave about 15,000 of the deal, cash flow about $150 a month, which isn't that much, but we're picking up a $100,000 equity position. So the reason I like this deal all the way around is I look at, when I'm looking into transitioning markets or any kind of recession type of market that we might be going into, right? The stock markets, it, it now is a bear market rather than a bull. We can do this deal any which way. And we ran our numbers at our rental. It, the cash flow is at $150 a month at a 6.5% rate. If the rates settle down and it drops down to 5.5, we can actually increase our cash flow to almost 250 to 300 a month and keep that equity position. So um, typically with single family houses, we own a lot of different apartment buildings, a lot of different, you know, we go with larger rental properties typically, but I call this my portfolio builder type of purchase where you can buy this, you can leave very, very little money in the deal, refi it, keep it for one year, and then I'm planning on trading that out in one year and then reloading that into a two to four unit at that point with the, uh, the with $100,000 gain. Um, just because the, the tax hit on the, on the first two flips just isn't going to be that big of a benefit to me. Can you tell us a little bit more about Tacoma? I don't know anything about it. What, what's the big economic engine around that area and what kind of neighborhood is this in? So Tacoma's got a lot of ports. The one big thing that's driving um, is the transit has been drastically improved over the last two years and is continuing to, to grow. So they have a big train transit station going into all the different neighborhoods of Tacoma, especially North Tacoma. Uh, I bought a uh, 12 unit right next to that as well. I like to go where the path of progress is, just like Henry was saying. He likes the areas where he knows there's growth. Transit's helping with the growth to get people to Seattle. Um, it's about 40 minutes out. It's kind of like a hipster city where, you know, it has a similar vibe to Seattle, but a little bit more settled down. Um, I would say that the job growth is still developing down there. It's, you know, most of people do tr uh, commute quite a bit to Seattle. The transit's helping. That's what surged it recently. And then the affordability factor of people getting just burned out on the expensiveness of Seattle is they, they moved to Tacoma. They can get the similar vibe. They got a similar feel. Uh, they kind of like this more quiet in general down there, but they're paying 75% less. And so that, you know, people are going where the affordability is. There is some things in the works right now, uh, like in the, it is a port city. So there's more import export going on in there. Uh, Tesla, from what I hear is looking at opening up some warehouse space, and so they, there is some anchor businesses starting to come in through that area just for affordability reasons. Yeah, man. Uh, well, I, you're speaking my language as far as as far as the rental numbers go. So for sure, I like that. I'd actually do something a little different with this one. Is I would do everything you said on the rental side, except I wouldn't I wouldn't cash out refi it. I'd uh, I'd HELOC it, and I wouldn't sell my equity. So I'd take a HELOC out on that equity on that hundred thousand, get about eighty five of it uh, on a HELOC, and then leverage that to to buy something else if I needed it um, before then. Because if it, if I'm in a cash position where I don't need to sell some, or to refi something to take the money, then I won't because your 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 interest is front loaded on a new loan, right? And so cash out refining and getting access to that money, it's more expensive to cash out refi it than it is to get a HELOC on it at like four to five percent, maybe a little less, and then leverage it that way. It's what I would do. Yeah. A lot of the reason we do the cash out refi anyways, or it's, it, it ends up being, yeah, a little bit of cash out. Cause when we're doing that deal to, to buy that, we need 15 to 20% of total project costs. So if we're at 
230 or 285 is the buy and we're putting 70 in that's roughly 350 grand so we got to come up with about 70 grand to do that deal and that's going to finance us back all the construction costs reason that we do that is is we're setting it up with usually a hard money or soft money lender to close quick because these are deals that to get this price the seller's also saying hey close in five to ten days and so we're kind of beating those terms and so we're, no matter what, we're going to have to refi it anyways. Um, a lot of times when I am looking at, if I know I'm going to leave less than my down in, I can bring in a secondary partner too and line up the financing at the same time and do a rate and term refi. Because yeah, that cash out, it does bang you for a half point right now. And so it, it's uh, that that's a great thing to bring up. But yeah, so a lot of times we'll bring in like a secondary lender too, just to cover part of it to where they're almost, we have a first at 75% of total project cost, maybe a secondary guy at five to 10% just to get the rate and term refi done. And then, uh, and that will keep your rate lower. We got to get you working with some of these small local banks and get you hundred percent financed on these things, man, on these quick flips that you're turning around. Oh, we love the local banks. Problem is they can't fund in five days. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, it, and I'm a five day offer guy. I, I, I'm going to come in. I want the right price, but I'm, I'm going to close, close quick. Um, it's it just the, but yeah, local banks are the most untapped resource in, in with a lot of small investors. Yeah, I like your program. 70 percent of ARV. That's that's a great well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's seventy percent of appraised value. They appraise it as it sits, but they're still they're in house appraisals, so they they base it on comps, and it usually it's pretty favorable. I was taking notes, you know, listening to the the way that James is approaching this deal. It's so outside of the way that I I I, I do business. I mean, it's brilliant, James, and I I love. I love your approach to this. I, I, I think, you know, what Henry had mentioned, uh, you know, getting the HELOC on that uh, sounds to me like the most favorable way to pull the money out without having to take that hit on that fee. But, um, you know, my, again, my brain's just like the lizard brain in me is just like, James, what, what kind of assignment fee could you get if you wholesale that right now? <laughs> so that on that we we would that would roughly we're probably picking up 15 20 grand on an assignment fee on that deal because i mean there's got to be meat on the bone for that next investor you know if they need to they're, they're going to need to get 25 30k out of that that, that flip jamil send them a hedge fund to assign it to it like 95 percent of oh it. yeah i'll get you a better i'll, I'll get you <laughs> probably 25 or 30k on an assignment fee on that that, that, that is true it's and that's something we always factor in we wholesale a lot of deals ourselves too where I would wholesale this, if I can't cl- cover my mortgage, I probably am not the guy to flip that property down there. I We spend a lot more time on larger projects. I like to be on bigger, more profitable deals because it eats up a lot of my resources. And so I probably wouldn't flip this. I would wholesale it to a client at that point that is down in that market, that has the contractors that work on that type of product. But I'm going to keep it because I want to build up my portfolio. Anything that I can stick inside my portfolio that's giving me a massive equity push that's paying for itself it, when I'm running my numbers conservatively, that's something I want to stick in my portfolio. I'm going to keep it for a minimum of one year. And then again, I'm going to trade it out for something else. I don't like taking on more debt on too many properties. I, I got that 2008 whiplash <laughs> where I got kind of smacked from from over leveraging. And so for me, I'd rather deleverage and roll it into something else just to reset. Plus I like resetting my depreciation schedule. Every time you make that trade, you can reset that and then get the more tax be- benefits in there as well. So you're keeping it, you're holding it for at least a year. I, the, the, I will have this for one year and a day, probably. It's uh, <laughs> one year and a day, get it to the 1031, get it to my, t- uh, so I can save the, the taxes. All right. Well, this has been fun, guys. We should. This is super I, fun. I, I, we'll, we'll ask our audience, but I, I think we should be doing this a lot. This, this is, is a lot of fun. I, I learned a lot. I hope uh, everyone listening to this learned a lot as well. We'll be back in just a minute for our crowdsource section before we get out of here. All right, welcome back. We just have a couple more minutes. We did let that section go long because I that was just great, guys. Thank you all for bringing these deals. It was super helpful. You guys learn anything? Yeah, man. I learned I need to have James review my tax strategy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely get smacked with taxes. So yeah, I actually want to go check out. I really, Henry. I was serious. I want to go check out Arkansas. Come on. I mean, I, I like the wall. I like the Walmart factor. I like the outdoor. I mean, it sounds like the Pacific Northwest, but a little warmer. Oh, you got bro. tech, you get you get outdoor nature, and you don't have 50 degree, 45 degree rainy days. Dude, this place will blow you away. We'll show you a good time. Come on out here. <laughs> Done. James, let me know when you're going. I'll meet you there. Jamil, you in? 
I'm so in. Come on, let's just record an episode here. Let's do it. I'm in. Done. Yeah, let's do one in Arkansas. That'll be a lot of fun. We've been talking about doing it in Amsterdam, but I think Arkansas might be a little more feasible. Same, 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 same. <laughs> All right. Well, we were going to get to some questions from the on the market forums on biggerpockets.com, but this show is running a little long. We do have to get out of here. So I am just going to leave everyone with one call to action, which is to go on biggerpockets.com and fill out our audience participation survey, I don't know, participation, whatever you want to call it, audience feedback survey. We want to hear what you think about on the market. You can vote on what your favorite episode is, what type of information you're getting the best out of it. If you have any ideas, topics you want us to cover, we would love to hear from you how we're doing so that we can get better topics you're interested in. It would be super helpful for us. Just go to biggerpockets.com. When you go to the forums, when the top forums is on the market, we will be posting a audience feedback survey there so please go do that and thank you all for being here for that i will say goodbye on behalf of henry james and jamil we'll see y'all next week on the market is created by me dave meyer and kaylin bennett produced by kaylin bennett editing by joel esparza and onyx media copywriting by nate weintraub and a very special thanks to the entire bigger pockets team the content on the show on the market are opinions only. All listeners should independently verify data points, opinions, and investment strategies.